So thank you for coming. I appreciate you all taking the time to join us for this session. Uh, my name is Walter Peterson. I'm with Nestle. And uh, I'm going to walk through today some of the things that we're doing around sustainability and what we're doing in terms of uh, a special project that you might have seen in the news as of late. So I'll go through that as well. So um, if you just sit tight for the next 30, 40 minutes or so, hopefully I'll make this worth your while. Uh, those of you having your lunch, continue having your lunch. It's always difficult to be on the stage after uh, a lunchtime period. So I'll get started. Um, today, you know, I'm going to go a little bit about who we are, Nestle as a company. I won't spend a lot of time there, but I think it'll help you understand who we are. It'll lay the groundwork of what you'll see later on in the presentation. I'm going to talk about our 2025 commitments as a company for sustainability, specifically packaging sustainability and how that might fit into uh, our future goals and uh, the goals, you know, st strictly for the environment. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about megatrends that we see underlying megatrends that are really driving not only Nestle's behavior, but our behavior um, and how we relate to the environment and how we relate to our supplier base uh, and some of that. And finally, I'm going to talk about a project called Project Loop, who some of you have, might have seen in the news. I'll go a little bit into that, and at the end, I'll, I'll take some questions. So before I start, does anybody know who this guy is? Anybody out there? Anybody know who this guy is? He's not the local brewer. He's not the hipster at the local bar. Come on, somebody must know who this guy is. Mr. Nestle. All right. I always like to start with that. I've got two pizza coupons for you because you answered the question. Why don't you come up and get those? That way I get you guys a little more engaged. So this guy, Mr. Nestle, he, um, about 150 years ago, this guy starts off making chocolate and baby formula and things near Vevey, Switzerland. So 150 years later, here we are as a company, um, you know, what we're doing uh, in terms of sustainability and packaging and food and health, it all started with this guy. So I got one more trivia before we get started. Gerber, another Nestle brand, right? Started in Fremont, Michigan. This is the Gerber baby. Does anybody know the year that this brand went with uh, the Gerber baby? Approximately, come on. Nobody? 40? 30. This fellow's closer. It's 1931 is when that brand started. I got pizza coupons. Come on. DiGiorno pizza coupons. All right, thank you. So, 1931, this guy decides he's going to start this brand, Gerber. Later on, um, Nestle acquired the brand and the rest is history. Okay, so let's get started. So, who are we? You know, 89, million, 89 billion in sales, Nestle, 323,000 employees, lots of factories around the world, have over 2,000 brands. So I'm privileged to work in Nestle USA. This is kind of a picture of what Nestle USA is and the brands that you see. Many times people don't know that Nestle has these particular brands, um, but I can tell you that in any given day, our brands probably touch your life in some way. Our purpose, of course, enhancing the quality of life contributing to a healthy future. That's basically what we do. So everything that we put out there hopefully does that. Um, you know, with a lot of our brands, we're really health conscious. Of course, we have an ice cream brand. I'm not sure how health conscious that might be, but in a, in a, in a sense, we try to put out our healthy and conscious. Product portfolio. These are some of the things that are um, in Nestle USA. You know, again, I mentioned Gerber, Lean Cuisine Meals, Pure Life Water, Purina Pet Foods. These are just some of the brands that we have, some of the brands that 
I work on specifically for packaging, package development here in the US. So April 9th of this year, along comes our commitment to working with plastics and what we're gonna do about plastics. As you know, around the world, plastics have become a hot issue, right? Everything from banning straws to banning plastic bags, the last time we looked at the legislation landscape alone, there were over 200 bills sitting or waiting to be introduced in some sort of plastic ban. So it's our world today. What are we gonna do with this stuff? So this is our, our commitment. Um, you'll notice that it's kind of a three-tier area. This is our vision about an active role in collection and sorting. You'll see a lot of that going on. 100% of our packaging recyclable and reusable. And finally, an increase in the recycled, uh, what we call our pet or our plastics in our packaging. <clears throat> so I wanna talk a little bit about global packaging trends to kind of build off what you just saw. What I just said, a single serve plastic is at risk, right? We all know that. Um, Everything from water bottles to straws to paper cups coated with plastic, these are things that are all somehow at risk. We have to find solutions for these. Whether we continue to use them, we have to step up and figure out a way to make them regenerative. Um, some people call it circular. We have to collect more. In today's environment, pet bottles are only collected at about 30%. And we need more of that plastic in order to reuse back in our bottles. So these are some of the things that you'll see, not only from Nestle, but a lot of a consortium across the CPG world in the US. We know a larger share of people are moving to more city environment. And that's really gonna shape how we use plastics, packaging materials, and what we do in product development. How do you serve that need? At some point, there's not gonna be enough trucks moving in and out of these cities to deliver all of your goods. So what is the next step? What do we do about that? How do we get food to people in cities and urban environments? We all know, and I alluded to it, that we need to act with the planet in mind. Purposeful, helpful brands. And you see this now more and more, right? People want to know where their food comes from. They'll want to know where their packaging comes from. People want to know where these things are going at their end of life specifically, right? Um, it's a big problem. And this will be a big trend moving forward. Not only will you want your food, but you want to know where it comes from and what you're going to do with the package at its end of life. We all know there's an increased digitalization of goods, right? The Amazons of the world, the Walmart with their jet. We all know this is happening. And what will that mean for packaging in the future? I mean, this is what we're gonna have to come to grips with. People are gonna wanna know and track their goods through the supply chain. How is packaging gonna facilitate that? How is packaging gonna be able to be shipped and moved and handled 22 times through the Amazon, excuse me, Amazon supply chain. These are all questions that we're dealing with as package developers and as a company on what will shape the future. Finally, customized offerings. This trend is very unique, and I'm gonna ask you to hold this thought as we move in to talk about the project at the end. But a customized offering, we know people will want customized nutrition customized ice cream, customized food. I mean, we're already seeing it. People want specific nutrition needs for specific people in specific areas of the country. We know this will continue. What does that mean for packaging? Well, as an option, it may need more digital printing, right? Qu quick, fast digital printing that allows us to create the packaging quickly for a specific need for a specific set of people. Finally, what I talked about earlier is this idea of circularity. Not a day goes by where in package development now where we don't look at when we put a package out there, what it's gonna do at its end of life. Where is it gonna end up at its end of life? 
We do not need to dump any more plastics into the environment. Now the questions are asked, okay, we're gonna develop a package, but how are we gonna get it back to its form at its end of life? Is it gonna be captured, shredded, and reused in some fashion? Will it be turned into energy? That's not as favorable as being recaptured. But these are all questions now being asked. And those of you that are in the package industry, I guarantee you that your suppliers or uh, the CPG companies, the people that you're selling packaging to are all asking these questions about this regenerative. Circular was a big kind of buzzword that people used. Uh, more and more people are using regenerative in a way that, okay, maybe we can design a package that can be reused. Again, hold that thought because I wanna talk about that at the end. So how, how did we get here? How did we get to where we are today? Um, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, here we've gotten to a point where all of our packaging is disposable. At one point it was ending up in boats going to China, which it's not doing that anymore. And now we've got all this packaging piling up around all these recycling facilities. I mean, how did we get here? What, what happened? If you look, um, you know, we became a throwaway society in packaging. This idea of not using a ceramic coffee cup and having a throwaway coffee cup, it was cutting edge at the time. And this is where we are today. We're in this very throwaway packaging mode. So along comes flexible packaging, right? So at one point we had all this packaging that was paper, everything was good, or people at one time brought their own packages to be filled at different small grocery stores. Along comes flexible packaging, and my apologies to the flexible packaging industry, but here we are. We've got all this flexible packaging now, taking the place of all rigid and some of these other things, but we have no source for this. We have no end use for when this thing is used at its end of life. I mean, this is how we got here. This is, this is the, what we have to deal with. These flexible packages are not easy at all because many of them are multi-layer. They may have a foil, they may have polypropylene, they may have EVOH materials all layered in there. And these are things that we now have to deal with. We don't want these things in our landfills. And finally, again, a throwaway society, right? I mean, a can is a great example of us moving to and still in cans. It's a highly recyclable item. It's great, it's fantastic, we love it. So not everything was bad, right? We moved to beer cans away from glass, changed an industry, the can is now two piece, and you know, it's continuing to evolve, but it's a highly recyclable, regenerative item. All right, so I've got another trivia question. I got pizza coupons. Um, what percent of the U.S. population has access, the key word is access, to curbside recycling? Who said B? B, sorry, I can't hear very well up here. B is correct. 73% has access, I got your coupons. <laughs> This way you guys pay attention. Huh? Um, so 73% has access to recycling. Now that's access, that's the key word, right, is access. That doesn't mean they are, they just have access. So that's fantastic in this country, 73% have access. What that also might mean is that you may have to pay for your access, right? You may have to call up your recycle guy, and say I want that blue bin, well it's gonna cost you 10 bucks a month, oh well I don't want that, why not? You don't want to pay 10 bucks a month to help the environment. Well, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't have that $10 a month. Access is the key. And as we move forward in this country, we think as Nestle, we're going to have to promote access, right? How do we do that? I don't know. I don't have those answers. But we're going to have to, at some point in this country, promote access. And you know, it could be bottle bills. It could be end producer responsibility. It could be some sort of legislation. It could be just that the American public decides that one day that we don't want to pump these plastics in the environment into landfills. So, 
Last part of the presentation, I want to talk about this Project Loop because this is so different than what we've done. And there's a lot of unanswered questions, and I'll take questions at the end. But Project Loop is we join with a company called TerraCycle. And TerraCycle, we join as a founding partner, and we um, launch a reusable ice cream container for our Hagen dazs brand. So Project Loop, basically it's a subscription service, but you're able to get ice cream from us in a returnable container. So those of you who've been around a while, you can tell I got gray hair, I've been around a while. We remember the days when we had beer bottles that you could return and wash and, and, and resent. We remember the days when the milk guy delivered milk at your home and you were able to put the bottle out, that bottle was washed and sent back to your house. So some of us in the audience remember those days, and some people have called this the milkman model. Um, a little bit about the model. These were all the people that were involved in Project Loop. What makes this exciting is that in today's environment of the CPGs, it's better to collaborate than compete. And I think this is great. I mean, I've never seen this type of collaboration for projects like this, not only for Loop, but a lot going on in the background for recycling, investment in recycling, and that sort of thing. So these are all the people that were involved. I'm gonna only talk about Nestle's involvement, of course. But basically, like I alluded to, what it was is, so you order a product, that product is delivered by UPS to your home, you use the product, it's in a container that can be sent back, washed and refilled, they're clean and refilled, and the cycle starts over. It's not a new concept. I alluded to earlier that it's the old milk bottle delivery to your home concept, but it's very new for, I think, today's environment and the CPG environment. This next slide that you'll see, Project Loop, is the haagen ice cream container. And if you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. It's made out of stainless steel. This container, you know, again, the customer can order that. It goes to their home in that bin that you saw. It's dropped off. That bin is very special because it's designed to keep these products fresh. And you consume the ice cream, hopefully rapidly, and put that container back in, go back, tell Loop that it's ready to be picked up, and that starts the whole circuits over again. What does it do? We're not using packaging over, you know, only at once, and this container can be used over and over and over again. So, what I talked about earlier, right, when I gave you the trends, single serve plastic is at risk. Well, maybe this loop takes care of that, or at least some of it. A large share of people will live in cities. This is gonna be piloted in New York and other major cities, because that's the business model. Act with the planet in mind. I mean, this is a purposeful brand, right? It can be reused and re recycled back. Digitalization, people go online, order their ice cream and other products from their CPGs in these returnable containers, sent back all through the internet. And finally, circular or regenerative packaging. This package then can make a multitude of trips before it gets disposed of and recycled. So it's better than you know, disposable packaging. Today you buy that package, hopefully you buy our ice cream. It's in a paper cup, it's coated with polyethylene. You use it, you throw it away. This way, you can use it, put it in the bin, get sent back, washed and sent back to your house full of ice cream. So, that's the challenge, that's what I've got for you today. Um, I would ask you at the end of all this, it's a radical concept and idea, but as developers, as package suppliers, as the industry, let, let's try something different here in terms of trying to figure out what to do with all these single-use plastics, right? Let's just try something different. So I'll take some questions um, that people might have. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
So I will repeat the question. So he had a question about have we done any greenhouse gas studies and so forth about this business model? The answer is yes, at length. And I think um, uh, maybe the question is around a life cycle analysis. And yes, we've done that. Uh, heavily life cycle analysis in terms of where this container will pay for itself from an environment standpoint. Sir. Yeah, hello. Hey, I was just wondering how long have you guys been doing the loop program and how's the uh, consumer experience or what, what's the feedback been? Yeah, that's a good question. So the loop has only been in, in test mode and the test mode was in New York uh, City and it was released at the World Economic Forum uh, two weeks ago. And we've also um, got a huge amount of hits that people that want to sign up to continue uh, moving that forward. So the answer is, I think we got more, I felt that we had more interest than, than what we actually had. But again, we're targeting a city um, only because that's where the specific business model fit. And again, we're not the only one. When it's not just ice cream. There are uh, deodorants in there, soaps in there. There's other products in there from the other CPGs. We just happen to be part of that uh, particular uh, test market. Chemical recycling. No, it's a diff that's a different loop. Yeah. Sir. Do you have any experience with the compostable films? or flexible packaging? Um, yes, I do have experience with compostable films. So, um, a, a little bit digression. He's asking if I have experience with compostable films. The answer is yes, and Nestle is using compostable films in places in the world where there isn't infrastructure. So, what we're doing with compostable films and compostable in general, compostable packaging, we really don't want packaging to end up in landfills and compostable piles. We want that to be regenerated or recycled. However, there are areas in the world we will continue to use compostable materials where they don't have recycling infrastructure. One, one more question. Um, are you, does Nestle plan to work with the MRFs or the recycling uh, waste stream directly to help build some of this infrastructure? Where yes. He's asking whether we're working with the recycling infrastructure in the U.S. to uh, promote infrastructure. So that's a good question, and if I could just build on that a minute. We're part of a, a project called Materials Recovery for the Future. You could Google that, look at the information. There's a consortium of companies, us, Target, Pepsi, um, Mars, uh, a, a, a small consortium. What we're doing there is we're putting in equipment in a recycling facility in Pennsylvania to recycle flexibles. So we've invested to actually put that infrastructure in, that'll sort out the flexible materials, bail those materials, and we're working on end markets for those materials. So that's just one example. It's called Material Recovery for the Future, the MRFF project. Great presentation, Walt, thank you. If you had to rate or rank, however you want to do it, the, the different sustainable packaging options currently available, recycling, reusability, compostability, how would you do it? Like, where, where's your focus? Sure. So Lisa asked where our focus is. So. I'm glad she asked that because it's actually my responsibility to do that ranking, right? I've got to figure out where do you go first? And I can tell you anything that's got plastic with it is where we go first. So as I'm with Nestle USA, I'm working on our coffee made containers, which are made out of PET uh, materials and uh, polypropylene caps. And we're working on getting those back into the recycling stream. And we're also working on adding recyclable resin into those bottles. So those are where we're going first. Anything that has a plastic, you know, 
in it, that's where we're going. And there's also some quick elimination. You've seen everybody banning straws. We're also doing that. We're banning straws and going to drinkable spouts, some of our Tetra packaging. So there's a lot going on. So we're reducing, we're making things available for the recycling stream. We're also investing infrastructure. So there's a lot going on. But if I'd have to rank again, Lisa, where we're going is plastics. We, we've got to deal with these plastics. Hi there. Uh, just curious about the loop program, how much more costly it is than what's available today. And then like I think about sustainability efforts and typically they cost a lot more. How do you view that as a, just a barrier to long-term adoption? Yeah, so he's asking about the expense of a project called Loop, this project Loop. Um, yeah, it's expensive. That, that, uh, that steel container is not the same price as the uh, paper poly-coated container that we have. So we're dealing with the cost, but we feel that as, if it's regenerative and if we use these products at a certain rate, at a certain amount of time, there's a break-even point there, and it becomes better for the environment at a certain break-even point. So as you reuse these containers, which they're designed for many, many times over, at some point, it pays for itself. And I think that's the important part. We also see that there's this weird, not weird, but a different supply chain mentality in the cities, like I mentioned, that people want to order their goods and get them delivered to their house. One of the biggest products that we sell in a city is bottled water because people don't want to carry it up four flights of stairs, so they want us to deliver it and carry it up the stairs. I'm not sure that's the right model, but delivering ice cream might be the right model or delivering food might be the right model and bringing it back to be rewashed is certainly the right thing to do. Every time we deliver a container, bring it back, I don't put a poly-coated cup in the environment that there's no place to recycle for it. There's a small company in northern Wisconsin called Sustana that's taking cups right now and working on getting those recycled, but we're a ways away from dealing with a lot of these poly-coated materials. This is not a question so much as just a comment that the haagen loop package is there's a sample of it in the packaging experience display, and that's booth 5497, all the way in the back corner, so you can see it in person. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you all for your time. I'll be around uh, this area. Catch me if you have any other questions, but I appreciate the time that we spent together. Thank you.